Hey guys, thanks for joining us this morning for our Sunday School Hour. Um, we're in the book of Numbers for any of you that haven't been joining us. Uh, we're to the, to the chapter of Numbers 26. So if you want to go ahead and grab your Bibles, we're going to begin in just a moment. But we're at a really important spot in the book of Numbers. Um, God has given Israel a 40-year punishment, and Israel's disobedience has caused that punishment. Well, as we get to Numbers 25, God, if you remember from last week, God had to correct Israel by sending a plague on them because of their disobedience. They went after Baal, if you remember from last week's video. And so God sent this plague, and it says in, at the end of Numbers 25 that 24,000 Israelites died in this plague. So the plague's over. It's time to continue the journey, and we get to Numbers 26. So I want us to unpack some things in Numbers 26 that I think you're going to find very challenging for us today. So let's look at uh, just, we're going to start at the verse, first couple of verses here, and here's what it says. Then it came about after the plague that the Lord spoke to Moses and to Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel from 20 years old and upward by their father's households, whoever is able to go out to war in Israel. God wanted Moses and Eleazar to take a census of everyone that was 20 years old and older. Does that sound familiar to anyone who has been through this whole study of numbers with me? See, I, I want you to go back and read how the beginning of Numbers chapter 1 begins. So, so let's turn back in the Bible to Numbers chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Here's what it says. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the, on the first of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel by their families, by their father's households, according to the number of names, every male, head by head, from 20 years old and upward, whoever is able to go out to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their army. So Numbers begins with a census where God says number everyone 20 years old old and older. And then we get to Numbers chapter 26, and he says again, let's do a census, 20 years and up. Now, if you go back to Numbers 1, in that lesson, I taught about a, in great detail about why, why did God have them do a census? What was the importance of a census? And if you remember, there's a couple reasons for a census in ancient times. The first was if they're going to war, you need to know how many people are on your team or on your side. So that way, after the war, you know how many casualties you've had. You make sure you don't leave people behind. So war was one reason for a census. The second reason, which we discussed way back in Numbers 1, was for tax purposes. So just know that... If there was a census taking, taken, something bad would always follow. So for them, when they hear God say, okay, let's take another census, uh-oh, what's going on? Because nothing good comes after a census typically. So that's, that's where we are. The first census in Numbers 1, it says specifically, was taken in the second year after leaving Egypt. That was Numbers 1. In the second year after leaving Egypt, 38 years later, we get to Numbers 26. So it's been 38 years since the first census, and now God says, you know what? I want another census of everyone 20 years old 
and older. Now understand, an entire generation has passed away since the first census. An entire generation has passed away. Can you imagine Moses as he watched so many people he loved during those 38 years? And we've talked about in these videos his, his, his sister Miriam, his brother Aaron. Can you imagine his grief as he's having to take this new census? And I'm sure his mind is going back to all those that, were, that are not a part of this census that were on the last census. So at this point, M Moses must have known that his time on earth was short. He was not going to be around much longer. How did we get here? Why, why did a whole generation pass away? Why have they been in the desert for 40 years? Why did God give a death sentence to an entire generation? Let's go back in our minds just a little bit. Because back in Numbers 13, we discussed that there were 12 spies that went into the promised land. Do you remember that, that lesson? See, if you remember, we discussed that the account of that story is also found in Deuteronomy 1. But Deuteronomy 1 provides us with more detail of how those spies even came about. See, we find out, Deuteronomy 1.22 says, that the idea of sending these 12 spies into the promised land did not come from God. It came from the people. And it says specifically, the people came to Moses, and Moses heard their idea of sending spies into the promised land. And he thought, yeah, it's a good idea. And so he trusted the people rather than God. Even though God said, this is going to be your land. I want you to go inhabit the land. I want you to, to, to go in there, and this is yours for the taking. And, and the people said, you know what? I think we need to send in 12 spies. We need to see how big this place is. We, we need to see how big the people are. We need to see about the cities and how well defended they are. And it was the people's idea, according to Deuteronomy 1, that these spies went out, not God's. So, so you see these 12 spies go out and they come back. And understand, we can tell when they come back, Israel began to rely on their own strength rather than the, rather than the Lord's. And, and we see that in the story. And so in Numbers 13, the spies come back and they give this bad report. They come back and they say, you know what? The land is exactly what God promised. Oh, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, it's a land with fruit. It is amazing land. But the people, they're huge. Their cities, they're well defended. We have no hope of overtaking them. And so the people believe the spies rather than God. And there are two spies that went, that stood up and said, you know what? No, God is with us. I know they looked big. I saw them with my own two eyes. I know the cities are well defended. I, I, I recognize that. But we have God with us. Let's go in. Let's take what he has promised us. Those two spies' names were Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua said, we can do this. God is with us. Who did the people trust? Did they trust Caleb and Joshua or did they, did they trust the other ten spies? Well, we see that they trusted the other ten spies. So they decided, no, we can't do that. And that's when God gave a death sentence to the entire generation. Everyone 20 years old and older, you will be wiped out. Look at Numbers 14. I want us to, to consider these verses together because they're going to become important later on in our lesson. We're going to start in verse 26. Here's what it says. 
The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in the wilderness. Even all your numbered men, according to your complete number of 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Your children, however, whom you said would would become a prey, I will bring them in, and they will know the land which you have rejected." But as for you, your corpses will fall in this wilderness. Your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness, and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness. According to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days. For every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition. I, the Lord, have spoken Surely this I will do to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be destroyed, and there they will die. So here God says, you know what? I know you saw me at work in your midst. Just think about this older generation. Think about how they witnessed God do amazing things to get them out of Egypt. How he he just completely took away the Egyptian army. And he freed them from their life of slavery. Just think about how he had given them manna. He, He provided for their needs. And it's this older generation that witnessed all these things that stopped trusting him. They never witnessed the fruition of God's promise to them because they stopped trusting Him. Even though they had seen and heard and felt all these things, they stopped trusting Him. Now, I want want to stop right here just for a moment, and I, I, I want you to just consider your life for just a moment. What have you seen God accomplish in your life? I mean, I could could sit here and take three hours and share story after story after story of things that I have seen God do in my midst. And it's easy for us to look at the Israelites and jump on them and say, you witnessed the power of God. You witnessed how He can save you. You witnessed how he drowned an entire army in the Red Sea. And here you are getting to the edge of the promised land. And why on earth did you stop trusting him? He's already said he is with you. He's already proven how powerful he is. Why did you stop trusting that? But the problem with that is I know what I've seen God do in my life. I mean, I can tell you I have witnessed God's power firsthand. I have seen him move in just miraculous ways. I've watched him do things that simply cannot be explained. They can't. And I say that because just like this older generation of Israelites, I can testify that my God is the one true God who is powerful, who is mighty, that no one can come against and and, and defeat him. Because I've seen his power. And I see his ways. But do you realize that older generation reached the edge of the promised land? And for some reason, while they would agree with everything I've just said, that he's powerful, that he's mighty, that no one could come against him, they would agree with all those statements. Yet, but for some reason, they looked at this promised land, and they said, oh no, we can't do that. We can't overtake all those big people. Those cities are too strong for us. We, we, can't, we can't do it. 
And for some reason, they doubted. And they took their eyes off of God. See, we have an enemy that never, ever gives up. He is determined to take our eyes off the Lord. No matter what we have seen God do, no matter what we've experienced Him do in our midst, through us even, we have an enemy that wants us to have a short memory and to forget what God has done in our midst so that when the next opportunity comes, He wants us to have doubts and not to trust the Lord and His plan. And he was successful at deceiving the older generation of Israelites in this story. He was. And they stopped trusting God. And they started to try to rely on their own strength rather than the strength that God provides. Let me ask you. Has the enemy been successful in having you take your eyes off the Lord? Like right now in your walk, how are you doing with that? Are your eyes on the Lord? Are you trusting Him? I know He probably has worked in your midst in the past. I know you have probably no telling how many stories you could tell of what He's done that you've seen Him do. But my question is simply right now, are you walking in faith? Are you trusting the story? Are you trusting your Savior as He leads you? Or are you to the point in your Christian walk that you're no longer really trusting God? Are you to the point where you simply are going to church maybe or listening to a video And then you're going about life, not thinking about God's grand plan for you. Not actively walking with Him and doing the things He wants you to do. See, we have an enemy that wants to deceive you. Wants you to get on your own path and trust your story and trust your strength. And God says, no, trust Me, I know you may have a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. Don't stop trusting me now. Don't stop trusting that I want to do amazing things through you right now. Walk hand in hand with me. Let me lead you because I have a promised land for you that you would not believe. Is there going to be opposition to defeat? Absolutely. Don't let the enemy deceive you to say that that opposition is greater than me. Trust me. Maybe in your walk, the days of God using you seem long gone. Maybe you remember those days. Maybe when somebody asks about your story or your testimony, you go back to something he did in your midst a year, five years, 20 years ago. He wants you to continue to walk hand in hand with Him. Oh, He wants to use you. Trust Him. Trust Him. He's not finished with you. He's not. But it takes trusting Him. It takes you keeping your eyes on Him. It takes you walking in obedience as He leads you. Don't be like this older generation of Israelites who forgot that their job was to walk hand in hand with their God. God wanted them to experience the promised land, but they stopped trusting Him. He had to use the next generation to fulfill the promise that He had made. Let's trust God. So the census was taken. Now let me ask you a question. What was the total number 
of Israelites. We're going to kind of skip down in Numbers 26 because you know what? It goes through how many were in each tribe during the second census. We're not going to get bogged down with details. I want us to skip down in Numbers 26. What was the total? What were the total numbers of Israelites that it says? Look down in verse 51. Here's what it says. These are those who were numbered of the sons of Israel, 601,730. 601,000 people plus. Now, let me remind you of something that we discussed way back in Numbers 1. And I don't have time to get into this in full detail. I would tell you, if you have not heard me teach this, I would encourage you to go to my podcast. Go to Apple iTunes or one of the podcast players. Search Arbel Ministries and listen to Numbers 1. Listen to that podcast. Because in this, in that podcast, I discussed this in great detail. But let me remind you something that we discussed back then. See, scholars have debated about these numbers for centuries. 601,000. And you may be reading the Bible and say, you know what? God says it. I believe it. That settles it. And that's fine. Okay? I'm not even disputing. I just want to bring up a point. Because so often we read God's Word completely out of context. And understand God's Word was written for a specific people in a specific location. It had a specific setting, and it was written in a specific language. And so we look at our English Bibles that has been translated from the original language, and and here's the thing. We we read it completely out of context so often. Now, I just want to bring up this point because there was a setting to these stories. And I want to invite you to come with me to Israel and come down into the south of Israel and see where the Israelites were during these stories. And I want you to see why, when I've been there, it's hard for me to see, is it really 601,000 people? And why so many scholars say that is a hard number for us to rationalize. And let me explain. Don't turn off the video yet. You may say, oh no, now Mark is getting into the heresy. <laughs> no, let me explain what I'm saying, okay? You're going to find in South Israel, where they're traveling for 40 years, and, and some in Jordan and places like that. I've been to both places. I've hiked some of these same places. You're going to find that these ancient roads are as narrow as they can be. Some have cliffs coming off down one side. Many do, actually. And the only way to hike some of these ancient roads is single file. It's one by one. You know, in your mind, my guess is if you're, if you're thinking about these Israelites and they're traveling around for 40 years and they're walking in circles, right? It's not even a real big area. Uh, they're walking in circles and you're probably thinking, okay, yeah, that's that you see this big, you know, just group of people, right? This glob of people traveling together. That's what you probably see in your mind because that's what I've always thought. Then you get down there and you see the terrain and you can't even see 20 yards in front of you. And you see that the only way to hike many of these roads is single file. And it's a tough hike. And and, and I tell you that. I tell you that because in if you lined up 601,000 people in a straight line and they're hiking along, if they're as close as they can be, it would be a line of 373 miles long. 373 miles. Maybe there's another explanation. And there's so many reasons why I say this. I don't say this flippantly. I have done a lot of research on this. I've, I've, I've looked at a lot of sources. And let me just, let me just throw this out there. That word thousand that we translate, where we get 601,730, that word thousand in Hebrew also means clans, tribes, family groups, okay? So you can translate it thousand, but remember, remember, Hebrew has 8,000 words, that's it. It's It's a language that doesn't have a lot of words, so one word means a lot of different things. So one thing about this could mean that there were so many units of people. 
that would explain a whole lot about the numbers. All of a sudden, numbers get to match up a lot better. I, I just encourage you, listen to my Numbers One podcast where I go into more detail on that. So, it's been 38 years since that first census, okay, of the older generation. And I said a few minutes ago, a census is usually taken either for the purpose of war or for taxes, okay? Well, let me just tell you, God's not taxing the people in this in this story. So what do you think the census was for? When Numbers 26, understand they're about to fight the Midianites very soon. We'll discuss that in a future lesson. They're about to enter the promised land. Do you think there's going to be some war as they have to take the promised land? Absolutely. So one of the reasons for this census in Numbers 26 is war is coming. But there's another reason for this census that I want us to look at. See, when they get to the promised land, the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to divide the land among the tribes. And they need to know how many people are in each tribe so they can give more land to some tribes and smaller land to other tribes. Look at verses 52 to 56 with me in Numbers 26. Here's what it says. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Among these the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of names. To the larger group you shall increase their inheritance, and to the smaller group you shall diminish their inheritance. Each shall be given their inheritance according to those who were numbered of them. But the land shall be divided by lot. They shall receive their inheritance according to the names of the tribes of their fathers. According to the selection by lot, their inheritance shall be divided between the larger and the smaller groups. So the size of each territory was given based on the size of the tribe. The larger tribes got larger areas. That makes sense. Smaller tribes, you got smaller areas. So numbering them, having this census, was important. Now, how does it say, though, that they would give this land? How are they going to make the decision of, oh, okay, over here, that's going to go to the tribe of Benjamin. Over here, oh, that's going to be, let's say, Naphtali. Over here is Judah. H- how did they make that determination? What well, says specifically in verses 55 and 56 that it was going to be made based on lots, casting lots. Casting lots was a common thing among many nations. This is not unique to Israel. The Israelites would have known what casting lots were because every nation did that. Simply what it was is you had different ways of of using some sort of, whether it was rocks, whether it was some sort of, um, just some sort of medium that you throw down or you, you look at and say, and you ask the gods what their will is in a certain situation. That's casting lots. It's a way of getting the will of the gods, and every nation did it. So it's not unique to Israel when God says, I want you to cast lots. Did you know about a hundred times in Scripture, we see this idea of casting lots, and it's not just the Old Testament, by the way. We see casting lots in the New Testament, too. Even after the death of Jesus, we see casting lots alluded to and referenced. So I want you to know that casting lots is something that as Christians, we're like, what is that? I mean, that sounds like Christian voodoo. I don't, I need to stay away from that. Yet it was something that God commanded. That God said, if you do this, I will show you my will in this situation. And they did it for many reasons. So that's, that's how they were going to figure out where each tribe was going to be placed. They were going to cast lots and let God decide. It wasn't going to be Moses' decision or any of the priests' decision. It was, God, we're going to let you decide where you want each tribe. He was going to be the one to assign it. Now, that brings up something that's really important to clarify. Did you know 70% of the promised land was desert? 70%. And maybe in your mind... You think the promised land, you think, oh my goodness, it must be so beautiful. It's like God's land. It must be luscious. And Some of the tribes were going to get prime real estate because 30% of the promised land is absolutely beautiful. It is. 
You've got rich farmland. You've got you've got some fresh, you know, Sea of Galilee. You've got places in Israel that are absolutely phenomenal. But 70% did not have fresh water, did not have farmland. So most of the tribes got areas that were less than ideal, according to what we would think. And each tribe didn't get to pick where they wanted. You didn't have the tribe of Judah saying, you know what, we're going we're gonna to camp right here. We like this area. We are the lion of the tribe of Judah. So guess what? Get off me, Naphtali. Get off me, Benjamin. I've got this prime real estate. That's not how it worked. They didn't get to pick it. God says, this is where I want this tribe. And I think, as I've wrestled with this this week, The same is definitely true for us too. We don't get to pick the land God gives us. We don't get to pick the inheritance that He has set aside for each of us. See, you may be feeling right now, wherever you are, like you're in desert. Like you don't know where the next fresh water is going to come from. You don't know where to go to graze. You are just in desert. And it's hot and you don't know where to turn. But it's in those moments that God says, you know what? I'm with you. Don't worry about where the living water is coming from. I'm the living water. No matter where he's placed you, understand it's okay. He's there too. He'll meet your needs. He'll give you what you need. So even when God brings people to the promised land. Understand most of them are still in desert. Most of them still has to rely on him for everything. And I bet many of you can relate. I know with where we've been in our cult, with, with COVID even, many of us have had to reassess things. I mean, I'm not speaking to people that don't know what we're going through right now. You know what I'm saying? Many times, just because we're with God doesn't mean we're in that 30% of Israel that's fresh farmland and you have all the water you need and all the green pastures you need. Many times, the Christian walk is one of trust that the shepherd's going to take us to the the next spot of green pastures, the next tuft of grass. He'll take us to the next water source. But our job is to trust Him. That's our job. We have a heavenly shepherd. He'll lead us if we just follow. You know, in Acts 26, Paul's giving his defense in front of Agrippa. And and he tells Agrippa that God saved him to show the Jews and the Gentiles both that that they could turn from darkness to light. And, And he says that they could receive forgiveness of sins. And then he says and receive an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Him. That we could get an inheritance. And then in Colossians 1, Paul says a very similar thing when he says that we get to have the same inheritance. Now here's the thing about that word inheritance. If you are reading that in the original context your mind goes directly back to Numbers 26. Why? The word inheritance means an inheritance that you find based on casting lots. It's the word for casting lots in Greek. And so if you're reading that through the lens of the Old Testament, your, num- your mind goes straight back to Numbers 26 and to how God says, when we get to that promised land, I'm going to divide the inheritance among the tribes. You don't get to pick it. And some of you are going to be in desert and some of you are going to be in Galilee. But you have no say in the matter. And I say that to say, I think Paul is saying this. Yes, one day we will have an inheritance in heaven. No doubt about it. But I think it's much more than that. I think there's an an earthly inheritance that Paul's talking about too. Not saying that all of us are going to have green pastures. All of us are going to have just a, a perfect Christian life the moment we're saved. That's not what he's saying. 
He's bringing us back to Numbers 26. And he's saying, you know what? Your tribe might be in South Israel where there is all desert and almost no water and it's 120 degrees. But you know what? God's still with you and he's still giving it to you. And he'll teach you there. So God gives us the inheritance that he wants us to have. And the point is, I don't know where you are in your walk, but God might not have placed you down in a field full of rye grass or alfalfa or fescue that's up to your knees and said, just, I've, got, I've given you everything you need from now until the day you die. That, that's not the point. What he's saying is, trust me, and I'll give you what you need for this moment. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't be anxious about tomorrow because I'm there too. And I'll take care of your needs then. And that's what he's reminding us, that he is our shepherd. But our job is to trust him. Trust him. Let Listen to him. Obey him. See, here's the deal. A sheep follows the shepherd. A goat always knows a better way. There's a reason why God says one day on the day of judgment, sheep and goats will be separated. Sheep go to heaven, goats not so much. It comes from this. Our job is to be followers of our shepherd, to be sheep, not goats. Does that describe you? In your walk right now can you say that you are a sheep that you are following your shepherd every second of every day or are you a goat that always knows a better way that always does your own thing oh maybe you hear the shepherd you're close enough where you hear his call you're not that far away but you're not following you're doing your own thing God took his people into the desert in the book of Numbers simply so that they could learn to be sheep. So that they could learn what his voice sounds like and they could learn to follow him. What about us? Are we sheep? Or are we goats? Let's close by looking at the very end of Numbers 26 together. Here's what it says. These are those, verse 63, these are those who were numbered by Moses and Eleazar the priest who numbered the sons of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. But among these, there was not a man of those who were numbered by Moses and Aaron the priest who, who numbered the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said to them, they shall surely die in the wilderness. And not a man was left of them except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. There's a movie that came out when I was younger that I watched. Some of you may have seen it. It's the movie called Liar, Liar. By, uh, Jim Carrey was in it. Um, he's a lawyer. He had a hard time keeping his promises to his son, whose name was Max, if you remember. In the movie, Jim's character's name was Fletcher, and so Fletcher stands... Uh, Max up on his birthday. And, and so Max, as, his, as he's making his birthday wish, and he's blowing out his candles, his simple wish was that his father would not tell a lie for one day. And, and as, we, as we see in the, in, the, in the movie, his wish comes true immediately. And as the rest of the movie unfolds, it becomes obvious that, you know what? Apparently, if you're a lawyer, it's pretty hard to make it a full day without telling a lie. And that's what we see with Fletcher's character, with Fletcher. Now, we'll come back to that in a minute. But, but in these verses, it says specifically that not one in the second census were listed in the first census, except for Caleb and Joshua. And, and I say that because God was true to his word. He said, every person's going to die in this generation except for Caleb and Joshua. And guess what happens? Every person died in that generation except Caleb and Joshua. 
you know, that movie Liar Liar, it really exposes a pretty major issue with humanity. You see, we tend to stretch the truth. And our human relationships are just scarred by lies. You know what I'm talking about. You probably can remember specific lies that people have told you that have left scars today. Now, many of our lies are those kind of little white lies, right? Maybe don't have a big consequence in, in, in what happens. And But let me tell you something. I know of one relationship that is absolutely pure. I know of one relationship, because I'm experiencing it even now, with, a, with, with one who has never lied to me and will never lie to me. See, the moment I accepted Jesus, I stepped into a relationship of total truth. I stepped into relationships, a relationship where I don't have to worry about if he's telling me the truth or not. I don't have to worry about him fulfilling his side of the agreement. And as we get to Numbers 26, we see exactly what God said would happen, did happen. God's word is always, always true. He's faithful. Now, let me, let me give you just a few verses in the New Testament, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, 1 Corinthians 1.9. God is faithful. Faithful is He who calls you, and He will also bring it to pass, 1 Thessalonians 5.24. God is faithful. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10.23 God is faithful. Let me tell you, we have a Heavenly Father that never stretches the truth. We have a Heavenly Father whose words always come to pass. We have a Heavenly Father that we can trust with every fiber of our being. He is faithful. And we can bank on His word. From cover to cover, guys, Cover to cover, it is the truth. What he says is going to, what he says is going to happen will happen. You can bank on it. Now, if you are a believer, I hope you would agree with those statements. God has warned you about things that does not please him in his word. If you're a believer, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you have the Holy Spirit that convicts you every time you aren't doing the things that please the Lord. Are you listening to His preference? Are you walking out His Word in obedience? What are those things in your life right now that, should, that, that need to be adjusted? so that you can get back in walking hand in hand with our Lord. What are the things in your life right now that you are doing because it pleases you and not the Lord? You know, this is not a movie. This is not a movie like Liar Liar. This is not a game. God always tells the truth. He, he always tells the truth. His words always come to pass. Are you taking His words seriously? Are you taking what He's told you to be in this word world seriously so that you can be the light in a dark world? If you're not, you're not being the light that He's called you to be. And His, his heart is for you to return to Him, to return to His story. Not be so involved in your own story and what you want to do and doing things that pleases you. And say, God, I want to have a bigger purpose. 
I want to do what pleases you so that I can be the light in this world. Let me tell you, I know God may have been, He may have placed you in a desert. That might be your inheritance where you are right now. You may not be in luscious farmland. But know this, God is with you in that desert. Trust your shepherd. Obey him. Walk with him hand in hand. And it's when you do that, that you will be the light of the world. In him alone, in him alone are the words of life. I'm telling you guys, he's never going to lead you astray. He is the good shepherd. Trust him. Pray with me. God, I, I thank you that you are the good shepherd, that we can trust you, that we can walk with you. Show us where, where we're being prideful. Show us where we're doing our own thing when we're not following you in obedience. And help us to understand we have one chance in this life to get it right. We have one chance to make a difference for you and your kingdom. Help us not to squander it. Whatever it is that the enemy has deceived us with today, help us to turn from those things and turn to you and follow our shepherd. Thank you for inviting us into your story. May we be your sheep and not goats. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for watching Thank you so much for your heart, for listening to a lesson that's over 45 minutes long because you want to know God's plan, because you want to be a, a disciple. And my prayer for you is to walk it out. Walk the walk. Let's be light in this world. See you next week, guys.